Good morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you to our session on transforming our health ecosystems. It's quite humbling to realize that with all of the technological and scientific progress that we've made in health and medicine, that we're still in a position where in the world today, more than 400 million people lack access to health care. So we're faced with an enormous challenge globally. And we have with us, fortunately today, from among um, uh, global leaders, uh, corporations, and organizations that are addressing this issue in, in various ways. So I'm eager to hear their points of view about how we best um, um, rise to this challenge. And uh, to introduce our guests, um, Olivier um, um, Bramicor, the CEO from Sanofi. We have with us um, Silvia de Dominicis, the Ethicon Vice President with Johnson & Johnson Companies. We have um, Thomas Bubrel, the CEO of AXA, and Marie-Ange Sorakaya, who is Managing Director at Gavi, the Vaccine Alliance. Thank you very much for being in with us today. So what we're going to do, we're going to have a, a round of where we hear from each of these um, leaders. And, um, and then hopefully uh, at, at, at the conclusion, a little bit of a discussion about really how we can all be involved in addressing these challenges. So I'm going to start with Olivier. And in your view, how could we best catalyze innovation to address more of our most pressing health care challenges? Thank you very much, Lynn. Um, if you look at the uh, 25, 30 years, well, the past one, I think we faced about two revolutions in terms of medicine and pharmaceuticals. So the first one uh, had to do with primary care diseases, right? And preventing them and making sure that, you know, they were not worsening in terms of uh, condition. That was diabetes uh, with eventually basal insulin. That was a cardiovascular revolution at the time, uh, you know, supported by statins and uh, for cholesterol and uh, uh, beta blockers, for instance, for um, high blood pressure and so on and so forth. So that was very important. And again, it was the first one. And millions, frankly, millions of patients are still taking advantage of that revolution today and more specifically at low cost because they came from chemicals and they are very cheap today because they are generics, okay? So second revolution has to do with specialty care and it's the one we are going through now. It is high tech, it is high science and frankly it comes from the fact that 15, 20 years ago, uh, 20 labs across the world uh, sequenced the human genome and it took us about 10 years afterwards to find the tools to explore the map and the human genomes, but we are there. And as such, there is a tremendous level of discovery and innovation, I would say, you know, almost every day. And the role of our industry and our companies is in fact to take that discovery work and to translate that in very meaningful, uh, very meaningful uh, medicines at the bedside of the patients, or let's call them therapeutic uh, solutions. Today, that uh, work in specialty care is very much based on immunology. And we are realizing today that the immunological system is at the origin of a lot of conditions. And of course, you're talking about you know, allergy, potentially uh, autoimmune diseases such as lupus, and. Uh, but also cerebral you know, diseases, neurological disorders, and cancer. And that is a big discovery of the last five or 10 years. So our industry is very much um, you know, focused on trying to control the immunological defenses in order to bring real therapeutic solution. And we're spending a lot of time and, uh, and resources on working on uh, immunology. So that's one. Second is, you know, knowledge is absolutely everywhere. No one can really work in that field in the four walls of its campus. So 
open innovation is a word, and we all, you know, working with uh, very open innovation structure, and at least in our company, we're doing that for many, uh, for many years now. So what is the examples we can bring showing immunology and open innovation? I have a couple, and I think I'm still on time. The first one, the first one has to do uh, with uh, a drug we put on the market recently, but the, the, the bottom line is you can't put on the market now medicines which are targeting two targets, right? Uh, which is something we couldn't do in the past. And we realized recently that two of the same targets are controlling a full path of pathologies, and we call that comorbidities. So in fact, uh, you know, severe asthma, severe atopic dermatitis and eczema, uh, nasal polyposis, and many of those conditions are coming from the same origin. So immunology allows us to tackle the root cause um, by putting those very interesting new medicines which have one axis and two warheads, uh, and they're very effective. The second example, and that's not medicine, it's technology. Uh, we have, um, you know, the, the world of healthcare is changing because of, uh, because of uh, artificial intelligence, deep learning, uh, electronic medical records, which we are gathering all across uh, the world. So that world is really changing everything. One example is something we are doing with the former Google Alphabet, with Verily, and uh, we have a JV there, which is called Onduo, where by putting devices and micro patches, controlling, not controlling, but measuring your glucose level on a 24-7, a micro pump, which is linked to those two by uh, Bluetooth technology, and uh, software in your iPhone, um, allowing you to take a picture of your plate and calculating that immediately, the number of calories you have in your plate, the number of steps you have done during the day, and all of that injecting through a remote control the appropriate level of uh, insulin. So, um, you know, that's a new world of technology, and of course that will be similar to much better and much better control and therefore outcome for the diabetes patient. So two examples of uh, something which is revolutionizing uh, the world of medicine today. Uh, of course, I'm not even mentioning access, but I guess that's maybe a question we can come back to because of course you want to be able to access those fantastic technology and there we have a little bit of an issue sometimes. So that's. Well, I think this is very interesting. Uh, one of the things that um, you, you've described, which is really these successive waves of innovation that have occurred, and you know, with the what we now think of as very basic pharmacology, the the revolution that occurred with the sequencing of the DNA and our ability to unfold what's going on with the immune system, which has largely been dependent upon that, and now the ability to actually use these mobile devices and um, harness. Um, well, technology that was really developed not uh, for medical care but for our entertainment and communications, but now we can use that for health. And, and we, we, see, we see these transformations that have occurred and that yet at the same time um, there, there are these access issues. And I, it, it's, it's almost as though we've not yet figured out how to innovate in that area as well. How do we take that um, drive, you know, toward toward innovation, toward uh, creating new ways to make people healthy, to figure out better ways to actually bring many of these discoveries right to the people who need them. Yeah, so access is a big word, but you cannot apply, you know, the world is very heterogeneous as we know. And of course, if you are in the US or in France or in the UK, you're not going to have the same issue of access than if you are, you know, in some, uh, low-income countries in, in Africa. So for the, first, uh, for the first one, I think it's a question of affordability. The problem of our society, or our societies, uh, is that we are aging and we are consuming more and more uh, healthcare. So, uh, you know, one way to start is to say, I'm going to look at uh, pricing those medicine at a cost which governments and payers can afford. And the first step to do that is in fact to use the most sophisticated modeling in terms of cost effectiveness, and not your own, but the one which are 
you know, agreed upon by uh, the, those different payers. Uh, so that's the first thing. And I, as, as the CEO of Sanofi, I said recently that I was not going uh, to be ashamed of any price of my, my pharmaceutical and new launchers. And I think that's very important because we are under scrutiny, of course, as you know. Then what we said also, and it's more specific to, specific to the US, we said we will not increase the prices of our pharmaceutical more than medical inflation. And medical inflation in the last two or three years has been around 5%. Okay, so that's a commitment. We're very engaged into it and we'll do it. When it comes to low income countries or low and middle income countries, it's very different, of course. Uh, do you have a hospital? How far it is? Do you have, do you have the specialized uh, staff? Uh, do you have a supply chain which is uh, secure enough? And as we know in Africa, there is a lot of counterfeiting going on. So there, we can't act by ourselves. We can't, we need to have private, you know, private public partnerships. We're doing a lot of things, but um, it's, the, the issue is uh, much bigger. Uh, those countries have to build their primary care system, and the first revolution I was talking about is there to help them doing that. And we're very much present in helping them doing that, so. Thank you, thank you. Uh, turning to Sylvia, I mean, so your company, uh, uh, Johnson & Johnson, is, is actually also very engaged uh, globally. And um, how are you involved in the, in the transformation of health ecosystems around the world? So let me start by saying that Johnson & Johnson, of course, wants to really contribute in changing the trajectory of health of humanity. And I think we are well positioned because we have been innovating for the last 130 years so when we first invented the, the first serial goals to prevent infection after surgery in the 19th century. Up to the current nowadays and the future where we are extending the life of uh, patients uh, when treating diseases like cancer, hepatitis, HIV. Think about the future of robotics. We are partnering with Google, with very uh, really to use uh, analytics, artificial intelligence, and focus on predicted uh, uh, outcomes. Uh, I must say that uh, despite the fact that we compete in a world where healthcare systems are pretty different, and of course uh, they are either funded through government or through insurance company, the need is always there. We need to transition from treatment-based to outcome-based. And so this is the shift we are really committed to do in Johnson & Johnson, leveraging the breadth and the scale because we compete in consumer, pharma, and medical devices, as uh, some of you may know. One good example of it uh, is our approach to eye health. So starting from, uh, I would say, a more traditional contact lens business, we are really starting from the healthcare unmet needs uh, regarding the eye treatment. And if you think about uh, the need uh, at worldwide level, 50% of the population requires some sort of visual correction, but only 10% are getting it. So what we are doing to evolve uh, is uh, not only, of course, to continue to innovate uh, in the contact lenses, but also to take care of the evolving needs uh, connected to the environment, uh, allergies, uh, or any kind of pollution to use uh, contact lenses as a prevention. The second one is the um, behavior modification, because nowadays our consumer wants to buy online but there is the risk they are detached from ophthalmologists. And so that's why we are also innovating and buying a company that ensure we create an ecosystem where you can only get your treatment, but you are also well served with some sort of high care through specialized doctor. Third thing, the, 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 the clinical need really evolves as you progress throughout your, your uh, age and your life because at the beginning, uh, you need to prevent and trying to limit the expansion of the disease. Think about myopia in young adolescents. But then as you progress with the age, uh, you need to treat it uh, with other kind of correction, with surgery, with the tear science, uh, and then until the cataract. So this is how we are trying to embrace uh, the full uh, uh, need throughout the life of our consumers and patients. So when when you think about uh, in the state of healthcare, 
um, globally. Uh, what do you think needs to be done uh, to improve healthcare? So, uh, if we look uh, at the aging population and the fact that we are extending our lives thanks to these new therapies, it's clear that uh, the sustainability of our healthcare system is no longer there un unless uh, we change uh, the trajectory of it. And so I think uh, to me it's imperative uh, that we really uh, evolve uh, from sick care to well care, to Olivier's point. Uh, I think uh, that uh, we need to really um, offer the right solution and try to prevent as much as we can. Think about a disease like cancer. Most of the cancer diseases uh, is uh, um, intercepted in grade one and two are curable and are curable with less resources uh, in the right side of care. Think about the new pet therapies like ablation that doesn't require a long uh, stay within the hospital while producing a superior quality of life of our patient, uh, improving the outcomes while reducing cost. Uh, ultimately means meeting the tribal aim. So I think uh, we, we as a stakeholders and we as partner of the healthcare system are well positioned to bring uh, an innovation there to contribute uh, to the health of the world. Thank you. Uh, Th Thomas, I think that Sylvia has provided almost a perfect segue to what y you're, you're doing because I'm very aware that, that Ox has been quite involved with changing the point at which you become involved um, with your patients. And so I think it would be very interesting to hear from you about the steps that you're taking to transform the health ecosystem. Yes, it's certainly true. When I think about your questions, uh, a picture comes in my mind from a film that is well known, Star Trek. In that film, uh, the famous doctor uses the tricorder, which is that handheld device with a, with a detachable scanner where you can see what medicine could look like in the future. Very simple, very personalized, um, and very different to what we see today. And there were even prices launched to copy this model and make a prototype, and it has worked. When you look today at your daily experience of healthcare, you ask yourself, where is that tricorder? It's not there yet. The reason is that the health system is very, very slow to adapt. And despite the fact, uh, what my two colleagues have mentioned, that uh, the health costs are increasing two to three times the GDP increase, so it is not sustainable going forward. We have affordability that is going down. And the question is, what can we do? And if you look at the reasons, the reasons are often linked to a misalignment of interest of the different party in this ecosystem. Starting with the patient, he or she very rarely adheres to the treatment. Thinking about hospitals, they sometimes work more like hotels than making sure that people quit relatively quickly. And then if you go through the whole ecosystem, you see it is not sustainable. An insurance company is in the middle of it. We are representing the customer. We have no interest except for making sure that the customer has a good experience and that he or she gets the necessary health care at affordable cost. Today, we are not in that situation. If you look in the mature markets, you see that public authorities are struggling with that health care burden and reducing the excess constantly. In emerging markets, you don't even have an access. Every day, 830 women die because pregnancy issues are not treated right at the spot. So there is a huge call for action. And we have taken this extremely seriously because it is our duty, being in the middle of it and being the orchestrator of the system, to really make sure that we can contribute to change and really make this differently. What can we do? The first one is we need to make sure that our customers do have the necessary access at affordable cost. This is often due to the fact 
Do you find the right doctor? Do you find him or her quickly? How can you adhere better to the treatment? And in emerging markets, it is clearly helping to contribute the access that doesn't even exist. How do we need to change our model? We need to think about two things. The first one is, what is our role to align those interests that are today completely not aligned? We are in the middle of it. It is our duty to give the customer a better experience. And this is certainly true for going more into prevention, for coordinating the care better, but is it also true to think what can we do to even intervene beforehand? Because if you look at an insurance company, you can say, look, what are you actually doing? You are paying claims. When you look how many customers have a claim, it's 20% of our customers. 80% are trying to avoid the claim. What are we doing for them? Not enough. They want to live a better life. They want to prevent the accident. There's plenty of things that we can do. There's plenty of our know-how that we can leverage. Know-how being we have many large medical networks. Know-how of the same customers that have already had a disease to help each other but also know-how to work much more on prevention. 70% of illnesses can be prevented. And so we need to really change our role from becoming or from changing from being just a payer of bills to becoming a real partner of our customers, which goes hand in hand in the alignment of interest with our customers, but also creating the alignment of interest within that whole ecosystem of health. So Tomas, I mean, the prevention message really resonates with me, obviously, as a public health school dean. But when you say becoming a partners, um, how are insurance and companies able to approach that, being uh, partners with your customers? So becoming a partner, to my mind, you need to completely change your philosophy. If we are very good today at paying claims, what our aim is now, our vision is, how do we empower people to live a better life? And that's where that partnership notion comes in. How can we help? How can we facilitate that people take their own responsibility to live a better life? And this today goes along three dimensions. The first one is obviously in the prevention. I said earlier, 70% of uh, illnesses can be prevented. The second one goes along care coordination. How can we find quickly the right doctor? How can we make sure that readmissions are very, very low? How can we make sure that the waste and abuse in the healthcare system is reduced to the minimum? And then thirdly, you have the questions around chronic diseases, but also elderly care. Chronic diseases today are 20% of our cases that make 80% of the cost. And if we listen to what we heard beforehand, illnesses are curable, but many of terminal illnesses will turn into chronic illnesses, which means the burden gets even worse. By a better accompaniment of our customer, we can make sure that this burden is reduced with a better outcome for the customer. And then if you think about elderly care, in particular if you think about women, Today, it is still true that about 60% of the women are the caretakers of our society. They are in the sandwich position between children and their parents and mostly the parents of their husband or partner. What can we do to alleviate that burden? And those things personally drive me a lot as a real contribution of insurance to society. Thank you for that. Um, Marianne, you are... Um, in a very unique role in terms of being in many ways a convener of many um, others in addressing some of the most difficult global health issues. And we've heard a lot about innovations that are coming forth that are, 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 are fabulous. We've heard less about policy. And I'm, I'm wondering about uh, the, your view in terms of the role of policy versus innovation in addressing the problems in our global health ecosystem. Thank you, Lynn. 
Indeed, I think it really has to be both innovation and policy together because, um, in fact, what we see, what we call innovation today are really emerging technologies that then continuously change and evolve and, and disrupt the way we, uh, we operate. And the traditional way of doing policy, you know, reflecting first on some of the impact and then designing, you know, in a sense, cannot catch up with the, with the type of innovation we are, we are thinking about. So it really has to be that we, we are seeing that we, you know, we have to look at the innovation, test it, but then probably go through uh, some type of reverse uh, a process. And actually, we have seen this at, at Gavi. Um, in fact, Gavi has, was really born, I mean, really has innovation in, in its DNA. It was born in Davos in 2000, so at the beginning of a new century, and it's really indeed about convening 73 low-income countries, vaccine manufacturers, some of which are around uh, this podium, and, uh, and uh, the global health experts, and figuring out a way of creating, building market for immunization in low-income countries, because basically millions of children were dying every year of vaccine preventable disease. So it was first bringing the access that Olivier talked earlier, bringing that technology of the latest vaccines. And we have been successful together because in 15 years, a vaccine that was taking 10 years to be available in a low income country is now taking one year at an affordable price because it's about a bigger, a bigger market, but also vaccinating 700 million children. So now the focus is really, and we want to do more on innovation, but speci specifically on the supply chain, because that's where we see in the, the, the issue of access, that's where we see that indeed in a country where you have no roads, no fridge, and so on, how difficult it is. And, and actually, we see the progress already. We have, we started a partnership with the government of Rwanda 18 months ago with the, the government of Rwanda, UPS, and a, a robotic company from California to actually provide a drone service delivery of essential medical services. You know, some of you may know, in some of the countries during the rainy season, you basically have for six months no access to the health, to the health centers because they are totally isolated. By deploying this system, we have been able now to service the country every 30 minutes you can actually cover the whole country. And you know what? It's actually the, the cost of delivering this is cheaper than delivery by a motorbike. So it means that innovation can work, and especially in these countries. Most importantly, what we see is that we have been able to, this is the only country in the world where you have delivery of, uh, of, um, of medical services by drone. So in a sense, because actually you didn't have the complicated system that you have indeed in the US and so on, where you have in a sense to see how you replace some of the existing services. Now we are using this as a reverse, as a reverse technology to now think through the policy that can be used through some of the centers. I think earlier in one of the sessions, Tim Brown talked about the Center for Industrial Revolution of the World Economic Forum. So they are now studying basically disoperationalization so these are the type of things, and it's feasible. So that's why we at Gavi are, are very keen you know, to partner, actually. What we find out is actually there are actually innovations that can be available and can be very useful in healthcare, very easy to use in these type of markets, but often it's about, you know, obviously these innovators knowing that, we, uh, that, you know, that, that there is a market for it, and um, so that's why we really, you know, I was in the Silicon Valley la last week and, you know, that, you know, we're really talking with tech pioneers to figure out, to let them know what the needs are and to figure out, okay, how we can work and build the, mar the market we have built on uh, immunization with vaccine manufacturers, but more on these other aspects. It's very exciting. Mm -hmm. I, you know, just thinking about uh, somebody in childbirth and not able to get to the hospital, you could almost bring the hospital exactly. to them. That's amazing, it's very exciting. Yeah. Yeah, so it, in following up in, in these transformations that, that you're, you're um, working on, which are the ones that you're observing and driving that you think are most likely to increase access to health care for all? Well, actually being able, you know, creating a marketplace, being able to bring uh, proven innovations to, the, to these countries, to a larger, you know, to, to this market. 
because often you, you have innovation that exists and the countries you know, do not necessarily have the, uh, the whole uh, technological capability to assess this innovation. So being this convener and actually bringing them together. So we launched uh, in 2016 in Davos an initiative called Infuse Innovation for Upscale and, and, and um, Equity. And basically, it's about creating this marketplace. You know, we launch an, an application everywhere, every year, and basically receive hundreds of applications, hundreds of innovators, and through a whole process involving, you know, uh, obviously innovators, business leaders, we select some of them that we know are actually, in a sense, the most needed for these countries. And in, in that space, you know, we obviously. Um, We've already had some successes, you know, we are partnering with one of, of these companies, Nextleaf, you know, that has developed actually uh, um, cold, cold, cold chain uh, sensors that, you know, we, we partner with Google with them to actually have this information available so that it helps actually think about the cold chain since they're getting the data so that we can improve because for vaccine delivery, obviously, cold chain is one of the key of the main impediment but there are many more like that. Thank you for that. And I'm glad you also emphasize the need for proven innovations that, of course, uh, I'm very passionate about the fact that we need these innovations to be evidence-based before we start implementing them. And, and that we often need evidence from widely disparate parts of the world because things don't work the same way everywhere. I think we've learned that in, you know, from, in many, many different lessons. So everybody in this room, one way or the other, is involved with, um, with health. And, and in the spirit of um, our um, daring, to lead, daring to transform our health ecosystems, really all of us are, are involved in that. And so I'm, I was just wondering in closing if, for, if each one of you could put forth uh, what you would consider to be among the most important things that could be done. And, and that might perhaps engage um, everybody in the room um, in, in being able to transform our health ecosystems. And I'm gonna go backwards here and start with Marianne. Thank you. I think uh, as, you, as uh, it has been mentioned, uh, the, the health ecosystem is so multifaceted that it's clear that we cannot do it alone. So I think really the idea of, of uh, forging these partnerships and really intensifying them, especially for the innovation, so that we can actually be able to bring, to develop first the technology to indeed have the right research and development so that it can then also be uh, um, you know, made available to, uh, to the larger population is key. But I really think the partnership is really what will, uh, the partnership and the systems to, to make it work is fundamental. Okay, so Tomas, it's almost unfair because everybody has health insurance, so, but anyway, <laughs> at least in this room probably. Yeah, I hope so. And if not, I'm here after the session. Okay, so, <laughs> um, my advice to you is be your own entrepreneur. Do what nobody is expecting from you. And I would like to, to link it to my personal story and the story of AXA. When I went into insurance, people asked me, are you crazy? Why are you joining this dusty industry? When you look at what AXA is doing today, you would not expect what we are doing. Did you know that we are serving in France five million people with, uh, with, with doctor advice uh, on, uh, by tele, teleservices? Did you know that we are curing of those five million 30% uh, children? Did you know that we are working in Nigeria on cervical and breast cancer to help women? Did you know that we, for example, are working in Hong Kong with Smart Lady to help the ladies to really uh, be better in their pregnancy and prevent? Those are things that you would never expect from us. And this is my advice to you. Women are today in the middle of society. Women is the potential of society that is the most unexploited because you are in the, the key people in the social fabric. You are, when it comes to taking risk, much better than men because you are anticipating, you are thinking about risk, but it is important to take risk and to empower you to really live a better life. 
Insurance can play a great role. Insurance wants to help you to be empowered to live this life and do what nobody expects from you. Thank you for that. And, um, and Celia. I think there's a lot of agreement here about the role of women in health. <laughs> yeah, so I would suggest three things. First one, really support women within your organization, right, to grow, to give them the resources, uh, the tool, the training program, the mentorship, uh, ultimately, really to push on women uh, to be the ones that wants to dare to make an impact. The second one, uh, ignite the new generation. So really working uh, with the new generation of young girls, because women are not only mother or caregivers, women are technologists, women are scientists, women are innovators. So let's partner with the new generation. And ultimately, communities. We, we said that women are really the catalyst, are the caregiver, are the center to improve the health of our communities. So let's make sure that we give all the instruments, the training, the tools, and the policies to build a better world. Thank you. Tomas. All right, so uh, healthcare is a complex matter with a lot of stakeholders, as we know. So uh, daring has to happen at different levels. Uh, in our industry, I would call on anyone to be part of that revolution. And the second one I described, because that's the way we're going to decrease the cost of medicines, frankly, right? Is by adopting this incredible digital revolution, as well as the revolution I was describing on the scientific uh, level, creating those multi-warheads, molecules. So that's how we are going to make those affordable. The so second stakeholder in our industry uh, is regulator. And the regulator, you know, mainly in the US and uh, at the level of Europe and Japan. And they need to embrace that revolution too and not leave, you know, in uh, three decades ago. Uh, do a little bit what they did for HIV when they opened up, right? Uh, created new pathways. I think they need to be uh, adopting that uh, digital revolution to help us getting access uh, sooner. Then governments have a big part in, uh, in terms of access and, and healthcare delivery. Um, it's a little sad to see that many you know, number of hospitals with a lot of beds with nobody inside. Right? So that's uh, one thing which needs to be uh, improved, especially with mobile technology. And I would say here in, uh, in this room, and I'm completely in agreement with Thomas, uh, you know, women are the chief medical officer of, uh, of the different, uh, of, of their families. And by such, they really uh, need to embrace wellness as the behavior. Because if you look at how much behaviors impact healthcare, I think 50% of healthcare consumption is due to bad behavior. So that's what you need to dare. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I want you to join me in giving this panel a round of applause. This has been truly a fabulous presentation. Thank you so much.